It's a great honor and a privilege to introduce Miriam Falk. You're here in your beautiful home in, in Yerushalayim. And Miriam, you came originally from, you were born in Hamburg, from a very, very distinguished family on your father and your mother's side. Can you tell us a little bit about your family? My father was from Frankfurt am Main, and his father was a Talmud Rochem. And my mother came from, uh, was born in, in Hamburg, and her family is, she was a great grand, great granddaughter of Rav Adler, the chief rabbi of England, but her father was Dr. Caro, and he, he was a descendant of either Rav Yosef Caro or the brother of Rav Yosef Caro. And um, my okay. and on your your you grew up you remember growing up in Hamburg? What, no, what I, year? I was there only at the end it, at the age of seven. What year were you born in? I was born in 70, 27 and in thirty four we left Germany because my mother said to my father, we leave Germany. And my father said, why? Why should we leave Germany? And she said, well, when you were away from home, I heard this uh, young uh, man who were living there in the next bar, uh, house, their um, guards all in black uh, uniforms, and they sang a, a song, the famous song, when the uh, uh, blood of the Jews will split from the... Um, uh, the uh, like a bayonet, maybe a bayonet or... From, uh, from the point. From, from the point. From the point of the bayonet. Yeah. And my father said, don't believe these songs, they are young people, they don't, they are not normal, that will pass soon. So my mother answered, I gave, six, uh, I gave birth to six children to live, not to die. I leave Germany with my children. Wow. And my father was amazed because in those times, in 34, the man would take decisions. The wife was the wife of the man. It was not the normal thing that the wife would decide things. But when my father saw this decision of my mother, he immediately gave in and he said, okay. So they put us in a children's home. My little brother, who was a baby, was taken by a, by a nurse to take look after him. We were put into a children's home. We were six children at home. And my parents went to, through Europe to see a countryman. My father needed a town with a port because he did export and import. And there was, of course, a city where there's a mikveh, kosher food, kosher bread, and schools, Jewish schools. So they came back and they said, OK, we took a, we took a flat in Antwerpen. Antwerpen has a big port, and all the Jewish uh, things that are necessary are there. And after a few months, we left Germany, and uh, we established ourselves in, in uh, uh, Antwerpen. Originally, my father tried to come to uh, uh, Palestine, but he, di he didn't know if he could manage to make a parnosa for his children. A living. So therefore, he asked um, friends in, in Israel, he wrote letters to Palestine, to ask people, could I make a living for my family? And as the answer didn't come soon enough, he decided to, uh, to go to Belgium. And when we were already established in Belgium, came a letter from Palestine, you can come to, uh, you can come to Palestine. But we were, it, it was too late, it was already done. And um, so we grew, I grew up in Belgium from the age of seven until the age of, uh, I was 13 when the, when the war broke out. In 1940, the war broke out. So the years in Belgium were went quite well. There was no, we didn't feel anti shame youth. In the beginning, of course, my, we were living in less uh, conditions than at home. In home, we were living in big houses with a big garden and two servants and so on. In Belgium, in the beginning, my parents took only a little flat and my mother had to do the household herself. But then soon enough, my father arranged to take a big house again with a garden, with two servants, a Jewish one and a Goyish one. And my mother would only look at my... When my parents got engaged, 
My father too said my mother, I have one big uh, favor to ask you. I hope that you will never have to bake panose in your life, that you have never to work. I will do it, always look for a living. But I have one task for you. Please, all your life, look after sick and sick people and poor people. And my mother was got very frightened and said, I don't know how to do that. So my father said, you will learn. And my mother, when she was more than eight, 90 years old, still visited sick people. Wow. She did it all her life. So as long as she could afford it, the Jewish and the Jewish servants were looking after the house. My mother gave only orders. And she went out the whole morning to do the Jewish uh, stoker work. And in the afternoon, she was staying with us. And uh, life in Belgium was, uh, there was a bar mitzvah of my elder, eldest brother there. And there was a bar mitzvah of my second brother there. And um, we, we felt we had quite a good life in, in life. In. And then on the 10th, um, 10th May of 40, broke the war out. Of course, there were all kinds of uh, Science bef said the war is coming nearer and nearer. When I had my bar mitzvah in May '39, uh, my uncle didn't dare to come. My, the brother of my father, if I created, if I emigrated to London, and he didn't dare to come to Belgium in '39, May '39, because people al felt already that war was very close, and nobody would try. Uh, dare to tra take trip from one country to the other. So my parents made all kinds of preparations. If there would be a war, they uh, prepared for us um, gas masks, because there was gas in the First World War. And they prepared for us um, special cards. We would call them dog cards. We had, they were cards with our name, our family name, our birth date that we should wear if the war starts and we should get lost. We should wear that on our, on our, because in the world war one, many children will be lost. So my parents prepared for, uh, for everyone also a um, rucksack, or do you say it's that? It's like a, a rucksack, yeah, a rucksack. Yes, a rucksack, a very, stro very strong rucksack so that we could escape with a few things. So everything that a person can imagine, they prepared. But of course, the Holocaust was completely different from what they prepared. And when the war started on the 10th of May, we heard, um, my, my, at very early in the morning, my mother came to our room, to our bedroom, and said, children get dressed, the war has started. Okay. And then, in a minute or two, my elder brother and my elder sister um, ran up the, on the roof of the house, and we all ran after her. And on the roof, on the, all the roofs of the whole surrounding, were people staying, standing in pyjamas, in half uh, costumes and half pyjama, some with a cylinder. Was everyone put on something? It looked very, very, uh, very um, amusing. In the sky, we saw little white things. We saw planes and little white things. And it looked very interesting. And then suddenly, my mother felt that we were all on the roof. She came up and said, children, down immediately. These are bombs. They will explode. She knew from World War I. We only saw white little things that looked so beautiful. So immediately, there were orders on the radio that we have to place um, sticks on the, on the windows so as the windows would not break down on us and um, make um, that there won't be a, a light coming out of the house, black paper on the, on the windows. And then came an order through the radio that all the men from German origin should come to the police. So immediately we were in a Jägerische Kehille, our school, all the, our friends, most of them were Jekers like my parents. Mo many Jews came to our house and said, what should we do? Get, do we go to the police? One of them, a Polish one, said, of course, a Jew never goes to the police for himself. A Jew doesn't go. 
My father said I was a German soldier for five years in World War I. If you don't keep the orders, a punishment will come that will be much worse. And I, they, they can punish my family and I don't know what will happen. Will I go to the police, I don't believe that they will do anything ba bad to us. They probably want just to write us down. It was Friday. All the things happened on the wet war on Friday, El Shabbos or Shabbos. It was Friday. My mother, my father had to go, and my brother had to go, and they never came back. It came the time of Kiddush. Nobody came back. Next morning, we went to shul. There were only women. All the German, all the Jews from German origin were not in shul. Only the Belgian, who were Belgian or other nationalities, were in shul. Nobody knew where the, where the man disappeared. And um, then it started the bombing. There was terrible bombing. Nobody went to the bedrooms to sleep because there was bombing every night, heavy, heavy bombing. And we slept on the floor in the salon. And um, on Sunday, there was a big feeling that everyone tried to escape from Antwerpen because the feeling was that the Germans would come and would probably come to the town and the bombing was terrible and the general decision was to go to the, to the side of France because in World War I the French, um, the uh, king of Belgium and the whole um, Memchala, the whole the government, government yeah was evacuated to the French border. So they thought, oh, if that is, uh, so, so, then it's the best time. So my mother tried to get a car, to get anything. My mother and my sister went out. And we, there was no possibility of finding any car. I have to tell you that my father, who prepared everything, prepared also a beautiful summer house quite near to the French border. He said, if there will be a war, it will be a good evacuation place for the, ch for the family. If there will be no war, it will be a summer vacation house, because we always took somebody, something beautiful for the, the summer. So my mother said, we have to go to Volsor, to our house. But how do we get there? And suddenly appeared like Eliyahu Hanavé, came a man with a band here of uh, Red Cross, he said, I am a personal friend of your, fa of your husband. I don't know until today if he was a Jew or not. I don't know. I am a personal friend of your husband. You have to evacuate from Antwerpen. Do you know where to go? My mother said, yes, we have a house in Volso. So he said, OK, tomorrow morning at 4 o'clock, I am here. Prepare the children with little bags, and I take you. I will put on my red uh, cross band so that nobody uh, will have the possibility to control your papers. My mother said, but I'm from German origin. Because we went out from Germany, legitimately, mm -hmm. but the Germans took, took the nationality away from any Jew who left Germany. So we were Staatenlos. And Staatenlos has no protection. So we, the next morning he came, and we, at any police station he said, I'm from the Red Cross, I have to, to, uh, to hurry on, to hurry on, don't keep me, don't keep me, I have to hurry on. We arrived to a house, it was a beautiful house, white house, the beds were um, uh, well prepared for us, there was food, there were, um, my father bought lots of food cans to prepare, that if, if ever something would happen and there were um, uh, plates and so on, everything was needed. So the first thing we did was to sleep and to sleep because we didn't sleep at at the, in Antwerpen of the bombing. We slept for many hours, we made a good meal, and then came knocks on the door and Jews appeared. The first Jews who appeared, we, don't, we didn't know them, but anyway, any Jew who appeared, the first Jews my mother gave a bed, then they gave, she gave a, a chairs and the, she gave half a bed and afterwards she gave the floor. The house got in a few days full of 30 Jews, nearly all women and children. There was one man, he was Belgian, and um, the time went on and in 
in the in in where we when we stayed there there were so many people it was a very little town like you know um, Samaric, um, Nahar, um, a lot of Nahari, if it would be f f suddenly full with thousands of new people, there's not enough food, there's not enough, there's nothing enough. So we, so we were standing uh, in line for potatoes, for bread, for anything. And so the children were sent to stand in line. So ch so it's a different children, there were 30, about 30 women. So there were many, many children. So we were standing, the bigger children were standing in line in different lines. But then they began the, the shouting from the front came nearer and nearer. So we had some time to decide, do we take refuge because of the bombing and the, the shooting, or but we lose our place in the line? It was not easy. Then at noon, we returned, all the, everyone returned home, and we brought in all the food that we could have made. And uh, the, the women prepared to get a meal. And we children had a nice time. The mothers, of course, had a, but the, the children uh, uh, in, enjoyed uh, being together. And, but the time be, became, became more and more critical. And then came English and Holland and Belgium soldiers with a very um, distorted garments, and they looked terrible. My mother spoke French, German, English, so she tried to, because being of an English family, she tried to make them speak, but they were very, very f um, careful not to let anything uh, pass through. So when one had to give them rooms. If a soldier appeared and said, I want to sleep here, my mother had to give them the rooms because they were soldiers. And then um, the thing began to be very, very critical. There was a lot of tension in town, and the house was full of many, many soldiers. And suddenly we heard, in the middle of the night, we heard a terrible a shriek, very shriek tone, and we heard all the soldiers running down the stairs, and the house was empty and quiet. We didn't know what was happening. And the next day was Friday. And my mother said, we have to prepare Friday night. It's Erev Shabbos, it's Erev Shabbos, we have to make. But everyone was very, very tense. And um, we felt uh, something is coming on. We, don't, we didn't know what. Anyway, my mother tried to make us through the Shabbat. And the atmosphere was, we knew the people who were sitting around us. They were all nice people. We knew them and we were trying to sing something. And then suddenly began a terrible bombing and shooting. Now, I didn't tell that a few days before, we made in the garden, we had there a big garden. We made, according to the orders of the Belgian soldiers, um, the shucha. Like you, you and play in, in in the earth to to go down in the earth. Like a trench. Like a trenches. A, how do you say? A trench. Okay. And when we came, we knew that we had that. And suddenly came a terrible boom on those. It was going worse and worse, and terrible boom, and suddenly a terrible boom. And we saw the stair, there were stairs in the house. Water was coming down all the along of the stairs. I mean, that all the water plums were, were displayed. My mother, who was sleeping upstairs, the only one who stayed upside, uh, upstairs in her room, came running down the stairs. And we all ran down outside to the garden. Like here, we had a door, a big glass door. And we ran all out the garden. and. Nobody went into that uh, thing. We all got on the, f on, the th on the earth with our hands on and to to uh, to save ourselves. And then there was terrible shooting and bombing and all together because the front was very near. The German and the English and the Belgian were were nearly about um, 
its uh, town. It was very near Dunkirk. And the, uh, the front came there. Yeah. And my sister, I didn't, my mother had uh, the, my br younger and my younger brother, my younger sister on with her, and she had her hands on their heads. And from time to time she would climb up and go, uh, call out, Miriam, funny, are you still living? That's my elder sister and me. But we couldn't answer because there was still again, there was so much noise, nobody could hear anything. So my sister suddenly told me, I, t I um, crawled together with another one to all the houses in the surrounding, trying to get protection there. And in no house did they open the door. They either called, either called go away or they didn't answer at all. So there is no solution. We have to go on and to stay in the garden here. And at about five o'clock in the morning when the when the light came on, the only man who was there came up to Miss to my mother and said, Mrs. Strauss, I looked through the house, I put the glass the, all the glass of the door exploded of course. I put the glass on the side. I think it's more secure now to take any everybody in the house. It seems to me that it's more secure than to stay outside. So my mother said, okay, if you believe so. We went into the house. A minute later, a bomb came exactly to the garden where we were staying. Wow. That was unbelievable. It's an amazing miracle. What a miracle. It, it was realness. Then, then we, my mother said, the German, ah, and then when we were sitting in the house, Suddenly we heard a table noise and my mother came, became white like the wall. And we said, Mother, what, what happened? She said, the tanks, the tanks. We didn't understand what that means. But she was a child of the First World War. So she said, these are tanks. The German broke into the city. First we heard a motorcycle, um, a few motorcycles came. Then we saw a group of motorcycles coming in, in German uniform, and then came the tanks. And my mother said, we are lost, we are Jews, and the, the German had taken over the, 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 the city. Well, um, went down, we, um, as I said, Germans need, uh, um, want always order and need. We have to clean, to clean up the house and to, to, to do everything that it's, everything should be in order. And then we'll go down to the, next to the city to see what's happening. And when we went down, I mean, I was 13 years old. I saw already Goish girls sitting with German soldiers. Mm -hmm. And a pushy pushy, getting cigarettes and so on. I was 13, but I, I felt horrible. How could Belgian girls sit there with German soldiers? That was terrible. So that meant we understood very quickly that the population would give in. So my mother came up to one of the um, officers and said, what are the orders to the, um, to the population? And he said, the, we see that, the, that the, this little city is full of people who don't belong here. Everyone should get home to the, to the place from where they come as soon as possible. So Motze Shabbos, my mother paid a lot of money for us to stay in the house. We couldn't stay because the house was not secure enough to try to get us into a hotel. But there was terrible bombing now from the English to bomb the Germans. So the whole night we, sh we went, we slept on the floor after paying a lot of money for, for a good hotel, staying in a, and I felt terrible because I thought when I was on the floor in my house, we all said Shema Israel and we need, we need, we were in together. We, 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 we were praying together. We knew who was sitting, lying next to me. But here in between Goim, I'm frightened of the Goim, I'm frightened of the, I'm frightened of everything. <laughs> anyway, then we tried again to find a car or anything to take us back to Dantwerpen. And then 
we began to understand all the houses that didn't answer my sister were full of dead people. Oi. The only house where nobody was killed or injured was our house, who was full of Jews. Wow. The whole street, remember I told you that the soldiers disappeared one night before. Yeah. The soldiers disappeared but left all their cars in this street. So the Germans uh, who, bomb who, tra uh, who shot on the, st on the town saw that there was a place of many soldiers. So they shot especially a lot on this street because it was full of, of, German, of English cars. But there was not one soldier. The soldiers were already on Dürkerk, on the way to Dürkerk. So um, all the houses were full of ho dead and sick people. In our house, the only person who was a little bit injured was the only man. There was a little drop of blood here, but it was only from, ga from glass, nothing really serious. So uh, all the cars and all the even the whatever was, was had wheels, was taken to take the bodies of the of the dead. There was no car for living people. So we thought, well, we were stay, we were trying to get by food to Antwerpen. There is no no way to get out of. We have to get out of here. There, there is no place here to stay. But at the last minute, somebody found a, a car that they had. We had to schlep it, but because there was no donkey or. St but at least we could put all on the bagage on it, and always we would put one of the little children on it, and one, one would take it in there. And so we wandered a few days through, through Belgium. There we saw the first, the first time in my life I saw a dead person, because we, we went through towns that were completely um, um, destroyed, and we saw, of course, dead people on the, on the floor and so, no, so all the el electricity and um, telegram ca cables were down on the floor. And, um, but then after a day or two, one of the women who was working with us got the, uh, got the mayor of that little town and he gave her a key to a wonderful house. And in that wonderful house, we, there was even water, we could take a shower that we didn't take for many days. And not only that, but English soldiers had probably lived there because it was full of a, a, a reserve of uh, sardines and all kinds of things, even things that we could eat as kosher food. So we could re really eat something and take a douche and try to sleep there. And then we wanted a, a day or two more and then my mother said, we have to take a car because my younger sister got high fever. And my mother said, we can't take any risk. If she gets sick on the way, that's too dangerous. And she got um, a man who had a big delivery car and he took us, of course, she paid a lot of money. And we went back to Bandwerpen. And when we saw our house, we all hoped, of course, that father would be at home. But when we saw it was dark, mother said, the house is dark, father is not home, where is he? On the way, everywhere, my mother asked, where are the, where are the men? And everyone said, but the, women, the people didn't understand what men. So everyone gave another answer. But of course, these were all like, So when we came to the house, father was not there. So my mother, who had never to take decisions before in life, be became a very, very strong personality. She went through all the papers of my father he, to see if there were any dangerous papers because it was German, if Germans would take in. She immediately cancelled the secretary and the servants. She cancelled the house. She said, now we are very poor. There's nobody to, live, to make a living. We don't know what's happening. Um, the police came, we had six telephones in the house. Six! It was at the time unbelievable, because my father had, to, had his office and the office of his secretary in the house. And then he said, I don't want the children to shoot. So he put a telephone on every wow. floor, so we should phone to each other. But we would phone and... 
So my father said, there is a phone, and still there we are hearing a lot of noise in the office. So the police take, took all the phones away. Jews don't need phones. My mother found a very poor little uh, flat in a surrounding, a poor surrounding. I remember it was a bad smell there. There was no heating, there was no hot water. We were spoiled children from living on a very high standard. It was all very difficult. And uh, the, our school was taken by the German soldiers. So we had to move to another school. And mother had to bring us because the Germans ran their cars like Meshugoim in the street very, very fast. And it was too dangerous for children to cross the street alone. And I mean, of course, there were no servants. My mother had to do everything herself, tried. And we still didn't know where our father was and my brother. And on Tisha B'Av, you imagine that was, um, it happened on the 10th of February. It was in E. It was E. Yes, yeah. when the when the star, when the war started, on Tisha B'Av came a letter to nearly all the people of our shul. One man escaped from the camp and brought letters to all the wives. And it came out that our father was taken to France to a camp. And they were first in Saint-Cyprien, and then there was a big flood and the camp was destroyed. So they were taken over to the Camp de Gurs, and they are staying in Camp de Gurs, and um, it's not bad, it's not a concentration camp. Um, of course, my father wrote, it's not terrible, I mean, um, we are not very safe. We had food, of course, after, but we found out that it was very little food, of course, and we tried to organize shiurim and to do things, to be busy all day long. Uh, and I would ask you very much, try to, to make your way to France so that we could make a reunion of the family. I will try to get out of the camp and you will try to come. So my mother said, um, we have to it was already in 41, yes, in 41, it was not immediately, of course, on Tisha B'Av, it took a, t a few months. M meanwhile, in the winter, we had to leave Antwerp. In Antwerp, on Shabbos morning, police came to Jewish families from Polish origin and arrested all the, Jew the Jews of Polish origin and sent them back to, Poli to Poland. So my mother said, if, they, if today it's a Jewish, the Polish Jews, tomorrow it can be us. So she tried immediately to find a place to get out of Antwerpen. And she found a place in, um, in Bruxelles. The, the city, in a, there was a family who was far related to us. Later, after the war, my elder brother told me my mother had helped this family because there her husband was arrested by the police and they tried to pay an enormous sum to the police to get him out of jail and my mother made money for that but my mother never told us I heard that after the war anyway my mother applied to that woman and said could we maybe come and live with you in Brussels and she said yes, yes my house is empty we have a big house and in that house I took already in one family with also four children, where the father is also in Gurs. And that is my, uh, my real cousin. And you will be, be in the other floor with your four children. So of, again, there were many children in the house, many children in the house, that's, um, it's, it's very amusing. So the children are not, uh, my mother was a wonderful storyteller the, as a lady from Germany was a wonderful cook. So all together, anyway, that until the letters of my father that we should come to uh, to France, the mother said we will it we will start the trip after after Pesach, so that not to get on Pesach on the way. And then the other lady said she wants to come again, or she comes to come with us also because her husband is also in Gurs. She also wants to come France. Um, 
Well, you know, it's, a qu it's five minutes to seven. I can't tell you all the story. I know, I know. It's, it's too long a story. We'll <laughs> continue, but uh, as much as you can. Sure, it's... Did you manage to... When did you leave uh, Brussels? Well, I d just finished that. Anyway, we tried to escape to France. We made the first border after Paris coming to France. But then we had to cross the border from... France was dipped, um, part, uh, partly Vichy and part uh, occupied France and non-occupied France. And on that non-occupied border, that was a dangerous border, there we were taken by the German police. Came police uh, soldiers and said, Hände hoch, ihr Jude Schwein. Uh, 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 get uh, your arm, yeah, hands up. Um, you, you, uh, Jews, Jewish swine, now we'll shoot you. So I was 13 years old. I had never had anybody lie to me in my whole life. I thought if they say they should, then they should. And my younger sister, who is two years young, younger than me, she was 11, said to my elder sister, who was uh, 15, funny, are they killing us now? My sister said, look at the sky, you see the stars, whenever there are stars, Akkurat Spurko is looking after us, nothing will happen. Fifteen-year-old girl, wow. and you see, nothing happened. My sister is 91 years old, and I'm here, she's in Buenos Aires, and I'm here. My elder sister passed away at the age of 50, she was ill. So, anyway, we were arrested, and finally we were sent to the camp girls. My father was already out of camp to us, and we were there. But then the whole story is written in the book. <laughs> it's too long a story. So if we can just show the book that you, is the, uh, Miriam, that you wrote, that, this that is, is the one in Hebrew. That is, a, I wrote it in Hebrew. And uh, you know, I, I wrote the book, I took a microphone and I spoke to the microphone and I didn't want to inter anybody to interview me because I knew I would get, I was get so um, emotional. emotional that I had sometimes to, just to close it and, and to cry. It's, it's unbelievable that 60 years after it happened, you are still so emotionally involved. It's unbelievable, but that's what is happening. So when I finished, I, I told the, 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 that I'm writing the book, only one granddaughter who is technically very talented. This is Ayelet. Ayelet. And I told her she will help me. And when I finished the part of the of the Shoah, I said, Zeo, oh, I'm finished. She said, no, you are not finished. You tell us a story until today. So that part was not so moving for me. So of course that part, I, um, I, sp um, I wrote, The first part at that I spoke was given, yes, I had to find um, secretaries who work with the Better um, Mishpat, with the... Um, so the courts. With the, the, yeah, court, the courts. They know to transfer from voice uh, to writing. So I sent them my, my voice things. They put it on writing. They transcribed it. Yes. Then, uh, of course, I went through it and with correction and so on. And then the next part, I just wrote into my computer. And um, then I thought, well, um, I made it until I came to be Israel. My dad, granddaughter said, no, mommy, grandmother, you tell us the story how you live today. And Miriam, can you show us some of the pictures of your family from the book? You got beautiful pictures of your, your parents. And this uh, all, all of the pictures my Ayelet put into the book. It saved a lot of money. Because, you know, putting out such a book is a lot of money. And this is... Um, and uh, and, um, this and is, I don't... You I, have it in English, The Voyage of My Life. Yes. But I think in the beginning of the book you have the picture of your, of your parents and... Is there also the preface? Yeah. Yes. Because in the preface I explained why I read, wrote the book. And I mean, I wrote the book in honor of my parents. When I began, when I was a parent myself, 
I so hope marvelous uh, um, educators were my parents. During the time of the Shoah, they gave us such wonderful direction in life that I had to write the book. And when I told my brothers, my elder brother said, how can you dare? And he said, e -e 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 physically, he said, e you can't dare to write a book on the parents. My younger brother said, how can you dare? That's all. When I finished the book, my elder brother read the book and said, to Darba. Wow, thank you very much. My younger brother never was capable to read the book because he was so emotionally involved. He was a little boy of eight when the whole sta thing started. And I would send all the pages in the beginning to my brother before printing it because I thought my younger brother was to together with me during the Holocaust. So it's important for me to let him see the things and hear from him his reaction. But then my sister-in-law said I didn't get any reaction from him. So I phoned my sister-in-law and I said, what's going on? Why is Jackie not reacting to, my to, my, to, to the book, to the pages I sent him? And she said, he's not capable of facing it. Did he, did he read it? He, he couldn't read it. But Martin did, your elder brother did. Martin did read it. My, my, my other brother, yes, they were not together with me in the, in the Cape, in the Shoah. Yeah. So see, my younger sister I can't face the things of the Shoah. She is completely a uh, Seudit. Um, she, she is a uh, home Seudit. She's in an old home. home uh, she's, her intelligence is normal and she's reading and speaking any, many languages, but she's not capable of watching herself or doing anything herself. She's in an old, old, old age home and she is not facing um, nervously the, the Shoah. I wrote, I sent her the book in English. Um, I don't know if she ever read it on the, on the, on the end. And I tried to uh, ask her a few questions in the beginning. I thought she couldn't face it. My younger brother couldn't face it. My elder sister passed away at the age of 50. I wrote the book when I was 80. So there was nobody to, uh, to uh, let uh, go through the book. And I wrote the book after you saw this picture. Sure. So I'm just going to show you, this is at your 80th birthday. And Miriam, can I ask you, you, you know, having gone through the Shoah and having come here on Ali Abet and the difficulties you came here with the establishment of the State of Israel and um, you saw you were in Yerushalayim during the siege of Yerushalayim. I mean, you witnessed, you witnessed, you witnessed so many things. The establishment of the state, fighting for the state, um, having survived the Shoah. It's, it's incredible. The you witnessed Jewish history, modern Jewish history. You are a witness to to our history. Yes. What would your message? What message would you give to? To the, to the younger generations, what, what message would you give to, to people? To the Goyim, that the anti shemiot is coming back. It's nearly as bad as in the 30s. Nearly as bad, I feel, in, in, in many, many countries. The anti-Semitism is going up and up in a terrible way. And I feel it's getting very, very dangerous in many, many countries. And to the Jews, I think it's a wonderful thing that I was born to, a, to an Orthodox family because I'm sure that it helped me a lot during to overcome all the situations in life. And I was very lucky in life. I mean, I got a wonderful husband, a wonderful family. I have a wonderful family looking after me, staying in close contact with me. Um, I have got a spoke who gives me good health. That's not a, a normal thing at 93 to be able to speak and so on, and everything is still there. These are all blessings from a good and I don't take anything for granted. I take my shower and I say, thank you for the water, for the towel, for the chair I sit on, for the possibility of taking my shower alone, for being able to live alone. Nothing is in my life, in my life, um, um, taken for granted. I know that everything is a blessing. And Miriam, what's amazing is that having seen 
what you saw having been well we'll go please god we'll do more sessions but when you were in switzerland and how you you were so hungry and you saw things that unfortunately not everybody was helpful to to the jews who were escaped into switzerland and you've seen many things which are very difficult you saw dead bodies you saw destruction and but your emuna, your yes, faith, therefore, your faith has remained I, I very strong. I decided to be either a social worker or a nurse, because I, I wrote in the book yes when when I was offered to be in the bank, mm. I said I could have it didn't save me and my family to be in the bank and to make money. I mean, if I was saved and my whole family, it's such a wonder that Abba, Emma, f- had six children and grandfather and grandmother, we all survived this as a Shoah. Thank it's something so so special that needs a, a thanking to a Kodosh daily. And of course, I could only choose to be a social worker or a nurse. I, I didn't see anything else for me. And then you became the head nurse at Charitetic. Well, that was a, that's an, a major achievement. Because, uh, you know, the, it just came out that there was nobody else to be. Li- I was not the head nurse of the charity of the school. Of the school, the for nursing. Of the nursing school. Yeah. Yes. For the nursing. Yes. So, this is a picture. I think uh, if you could just share it with the. That's the only picture. The only picture where the six children are together. It's unbelievable, and that was in. My didn't tell now in the video. My eldest brother Walter, who is now nearly 98 he lives in this in give shaul he studies every day for an hour at least tomorrow to prepare himself for the chevrot will come so as to be prepared he tries to go out every day to make a li- little war he is just up to date in everything marvelous walter was sent by my parents was asked by my parents he was born in uh, in uh, Denmark, because my parents were the first year of their wedding, after the wedding, living in Denmark, and Walter was born in Denmark, so he was not on a German um, um, quarter like all the Jews, but he was on a, a Danish quarter, and you could get a, a paper for uni- for America visa very easily from a Danish court. So my parents um, were told by other refugees who were on their way to America, why don't you use the na- the, your son, who is, was born in Denmark, to send him to, New, to uh, America? So my parents, it was on Yontif, it was some Yontif, Shabbos. My parents, I remember it was a Motze Shabbos or Motze Yontif, my parents phoned, Jackie, uh, Walter was in Getzet in the yeshiva. He was from Belgium, he went to the yeshiva in Getzet. And they found Walter and they said, Walter, you can escape to um, to America because you were born in Can- in Denmark. Are you ready to go? And he said, Well, maybe I am the Yosef before Yosef Lifina Machane. Maybe it's uh, the right thing to do. He was 17 years old. At the time, 17 was not an age to be alone, immigrating alone. But he immediately said, Okay, I take it. And so Walter was not with us. Before Walter's leaving, my parents made this picture. You see, my, my mother, my father, and all the children. We were never again six children. Never. We met after, the, we all survived, and we were always at most five children together. Never six children with my parents together. And what's amazing is that you have the, that the picture survived. So I'm just going to show. Um, you know, this is the the picture. But you know, my sister and my brother were living after the war in in America. So either my brother was just on a visit here, or my sister was here on a visit. But they were never at the same time. Or Martin, my, and my other brother, was living in Paris. It never happened that all the six children would meet. Never. But Miriam, I think what's also amazing is that your father had the insight to prepare a, a, a home with, with food provisions and your parents and your mother had the insight to leave, to leave uh, Germany. 
And Baruch Hashem, your, 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 your father listened to your mother and, and you didn't remain in Germany and, and you managed to get to Belgium. We never understood, we don't an, an, know until today, how did it happen that there was always money. When we went on the way, we were, we were taken to Camp Gurs on the way. And we were, the, the soldiers lied to us, they told us that we were taken, going to meet our parents, uh, our father. And then I went with them uh, and I heard that they buy, buy a ticket for camp, for girls. So my mother, on, we were in a train for two days, I think. From the train, there was a stop, my mother sent a telegram to my father. We are arrested, we are taken to girls. At the next station, there was a Jew standing with food and money. Amazing. My father arranged that the next he knew where we would be standing, and there was somebody giving my mother some food and some money. There was always something there. I don't know how my father read. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable, and my father didn't work for many years. And we don't know how he, he did it. That there was always... At the, we were in Marseille. My, the, the food was very rationed. There was very f f um, little food. So my mother had always to buy uh, false papers to, to buy more food. That was a lot of money. The money was there. I don't know how it ended. And you must say you were with Rash Nielsen. But how my father so uh, got the money out of the country in time. That's my bra my Walter says, says that in the Gemara it's written that you have to make your money in different places, and my father was going according to the Gemara. Wow. But it's unbelievable. There are many things that are unbelievable. And Miriam, can I just ask? We'll go. We, please, God, in the future we'll discuss it. But you had a very close connection with Chabad, with uh, Rav Nielsen. With Rav Nielsen, of course. We were in the, living in, in in his children's home. Yes, and that is the cousin of the of the big uh, uh, of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And Miriam, also in your book, you write something which is very, very amazing, uh, and I found it. They read the book. The, the foundation of Schneerson read the book, because the daughter of Rav Schneerson is Hadassah. Hadassah was a personal friend of my elder sister, and um, I have a person who is far related to me. You have heard of uh, Arthur Korn, who got the... Yeah. You know him? Mm -hmm. oh, this is my family also. Sure. His parents were the ones who invited my parents in Basel. His parents lived in, in, in Basel. They were very famous in, in making, in the filmmaking. And um, it, um, his... Um, um, a few weeks ago, the brother of Arthur was sitting here, in, the, in this chair here. Gabi was sitting here, the younger brother. Um, the son, the daughter of the eldest uh, of the eldest um, brother of Arthur was Dodi Kohn. He was a psychologist. He passed away from uh, his uh, cancer. His daughter is in contact with Hadassah Schneerson in New York because the Kohns are related to Schleimele Karlebach. That's the German, that's one side of the family. So um, Hadassah was married to the brother of Schleimi Karnebach, the twin brother. So um, I, I know from Rushi, who was in contact with Hadassah, that Hadassah took my, they read my, the part of my book, and, they, and I think even came, they came also to interview me. So many people interviewed me, I don't remember anymore. And Miriam, I just want to ask you, in your book you write something quite amazing, and I think it's very unique, that you had quite a few non-Jewish people through the whole your whole journey during the Shoah that went out of their way to help. You even had a, 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 um, somebody who, a housekeeper and somebody who helped in the house, who was not Jewish, and she eventually came to, to Palestine when it was under the British. Mm. The, like a maid who who worked for you ah, and, oh, and, man. Hilde, and, and, Hilde. and she she converted. Yes. And she came because here. Our house was very very Jewish, and very very humane, and I think that people all the people were were influenced by my father. 
you must see you had from it's unbelievable uh, from Scoot a word. I said once to my bra elder brother we seem to have very good genes that we are so old my brother said what are you speaking about Scoot's overs it's, you really had the most remarkable parents that uh, had such an insight like a Nabua they had a therefore I wrote the book you know when my father said a little story I was 14 or 15 I came home, my father was in a camp near Marseille. My father was this prominent man in a camp, in a, and he was, sometimes he was home. He was, was home, we were in a hotel room where we had less ma beds than we were people, less chairs than we were people, less uh, salachot or whatever. But we, we were not in a camp, we were in a home, in a, in a hotel room. And I came home. And my father was there. I said, Oh, Yofi, Abba, Siddharth Yotam. And my father said, What, what means Siddharth Yotam? I arranged this, these French people. He said, What did you do? He said, I said, I answered, I walked into the bus, and as driver didn't see me and I didn't pay. And he said, Why have you done that? He said, They took away everything from you. Your panosa, your, you work in your, your same Shabbos. Uh, uh, costumes for five years. You you done all the COVID and everything they have taken for us. My father said, "My poor child, we have only soiled you on the show. That's the only thing you did." Good Isn't that wonderful? He was against what in you 40, did. Uh -huh. In forty, in forty-three, my father in such a condition. That was his answer. I mean, that's unbelievable. And Miriam, didn't your father, when he couldn't see you, he got somebody to come and to give you and, and your your siblings a blessing? What? He, he organized somebody to come to your home to give a blessing. Yes. It's incredible how he he thought of every single detail. And When my sister was lying in the... I told him that my sister is lying in the snow. He went there, gave her a blessing, took out money of his pocket and gave her mother. Unbelievable. Well, it's been a blessing for me to, to meet you and to hear your story and please God, we'll hear more, but uh, Miriam, I cannot thank you enough. We had just, Amon Amon Shruyot, Shrut Parer, Shrut Avot, and Birkat Hashem. I feel we cut a shem and, and, and if I have wonderful children, wonderful uh, grandchildren. I got another, I have Baruch Hashem quite a bunch full of great grandchildren. I got a great grandson on, now on Tisha B'Av. Oh, Baruch Hashem, Mazel yeah. Tov. Baruch Tia. I, I mean, I am blessed by Kodesh Baruch. I'm only blessed. Oh, well, Miriam, thank you so very much. And I tell people, if they complain, it's difficult, this is difficult, this is difficult. There's always in one door closes, there's another door that was, it will open. And nothing is too difficult in life. Everything will go through and will come a better time. We have just to take things in proportion. When a person says everything is terrible, think of proportion and then you'll see that it's not so terrible. And Miriam, lastly, if I can ask you, what you saw and what, as a young girl, as such as you were only 13 and 14 going through the Shoah, but your Imana, your faith, you, you kept such a strong Imana and your family. Sometimes, I, sometimes um, I remember when I was at Shari Tzedek, there was a time I said, I will rebel. I will not keep Shabbos once. I will see what that means. It was impossible. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I tried. I thought I have to rebel. I have to try another way or something. It was just impossible. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Yes. Well, thank you so and much. Just like I never smoked the first cigarette because I saw other nurses smoking cigarettes. And I said, if I love it, then I'm lost because then one cigarette will come to the next one. And if I don't love it, why should I try it? So I never tried the first one. <laughs> and Miriam, I just want to ask you, didn't Dr. Wallach, in your interview, offer you a cigarette? 
when you went to your interview with Dr. Wallach, who who founded Sherry Tzedek, didn't he offer you a cigarette in your in your interview, and you re you declined? Yes. And I think he said if you would have taken the cigarette, he doesn't know if he would have accepted you. Yes, and he said also to me, well, if you would start the third year, and you will go down to the second year, and then then you will see what you miss, then you will do the first year. Well, Miriam, thank you so much. He said to a friend of mine who got married very late, and she was a wonderful person, she's not living anymore, she was a wonderful person. She lost all her family in the Shoah and so on and so on. And one day he sees her in Sharet Zedek and he says, Who are you? And she said, Well, Dr. Barak, you know, I am still a son. So she again, uh, still? <laughs> but you know, he, he never got married actually. He devoted his whole life to, to the hospital. There is a story that he, that Araf um, Sonnenfeld said he must get married because otherwise he's not allowed to have a woman keeping his floor at his house and so on. So he said, okay, I make, I give a um, ksuva, but five minutes later I give a get. So I have been given, given a ksuva and I give a get. And that was a personal, um, a person who was related to Rav Sonnenfeld and she was epileptic. So he knew he couldn't marry her. And um, so she, she could take over her, his household and she was not forbidden because I Rav Sonnenfeld wow. gave I'm not sure if that's right. That is a story that's going through. I don't know, I have uh, heard the story a few times. I'm not sure if that's right or not. I, I know that, Rav, that Dr. Bala gave all his life to his, to his patients. And never at the end he was demented. His brothers also, they were all demented. And we looked after all the brothers. It was terrible. But Miriam, in, in your family, um, on, on your mother's side was from the Adler, who became both chief rabbis of, of England. And your, your family was very connected with the Gedolim, with the Chaim Oza. Your, your father was also with um, uh, Samson Raphael Hirsch from, from Frankfurt. And learning was a very important part of uh, learning and uh, studying, and it was a very important part you of. See, my father had a time at home, paying monthly for a time at home, living at home, uh, staying at home, not living. He lived with his wife, so said his duty was to take at least to give at least one shear my father a day. He said, if your duty is to take me out of my office and to make me learning, and my. My brother said, "Why did he be, Why did he go to get said? Because when he was a young boy, he saw once my father coming out of the room after learning with Rav Kresh, and my father was beaming, and he said, such a beaming I have never seen on father. I want to do the same thing, and therefore he decided to study Gemara. And in a way, it saved his life because from Gateshead he could go to 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 America. Yes. Well, there are blessings and blessings and blessings on the Kodesh Baruch In your family, when you hear the story, there were so many nisim, so many miracles. Yes. Yes, we have we have seen many many miracles. Another miracle was. When we were refoulé, uh, when we were sent out of Switzerland, it was in the night of 31, uh, 31st December 1943. And the, 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 the nice Swiss soldiers sent us back from Switzerland to France. Yeah. And we thought that France is probably our death, but anyway. And we were sent back on the night of uh, Christmas night, 31 December. And that was our luck, because then the Germans at the border, uh, the French arrested us, because the Germans who were standing together with the uh, French were, uh, uh, went away to drink beer, because it was 31 December. So the French arrested us. The French arrested us as people who were on the border. 
if the Germans would have arrested us, they would have arrested us as Jews, would have sent us us to Auschwitz. And Miriam, can that I was just... A, me, uh, that was a miracle. miracle. Every year I would phone my brother, as long as my sister was living, on the 31 of December, and I would phone them and I said, tonight is our nest. Now I have nobody to tell anymore, I'm the only survivor. There was a good friend also, Elimo, Elie Thorne, and um, he was with us. So I would phone all the people who were with us, on, but uh, now I stayed alone. <laughs> stay alone. But I remember that night, that it's the night of the miracle. And also what I think is amazing from your book is that you tried more than, more than once, twice. You actually went to get into Switzerland. Uh, you were, uh, you got in and then at the border, unfortunately uh, somebody After who a day or two they sent us back, not at the border. At the border sent back another, wa another woman and my father immediately gave her all his cartis, uh, cartis, um, cartis de ravitaillement, that means the... The, the, the rations. The rations, the, the food rations. rations. We the went, when we were sent back, we had no, no rations anymore because my father had given them to them. But Miriam, the very first time when you tried to cross the border, you had a Jewish smuggler. And unfortunately, um, it didn't, he, didn't, he wasn't so honest. He wasn't honest at all. And yet you, and he let you down, which was very sad. And, and my brother, Martin, found him after the war and went up to him and said, how did you dare do that to my parents? You, ne you nearly killed them. Yeah. He said, so what? He said, you, n you must at least pay an indemnity for, to my father. He said, take me to court. You want to take me to court? He said, even take me to the, to a, to a, to a, a, a bestin. In what bestin can you bring Edut? There's no witnesses. You have a Edut? You have something? You have nothing. But it's so sad to think that a Jew, that he a Jew, did it for. Yeah, you know, it's very sad. But what is more amazing is that your parents they didn't give up and they tried again. And when they went the second time, three times. I know the second time they were you. I think you were in Geneva, and then they sent you back. That is so unbelievable, Huck. And you, and you said, but you're sending us back to our death. Because the parents knew there was no way out. And the third time, my parents went alone. My younger sister, my younger brother alone, and my elder sister and me alone. My parents went um, by boat, a little boat on the Lac de Genève. On uh, the Geneva Lake. And my, um, and then, my, and then the parents of, of Arthur Cohn took them in, in Basel. They heard that they arrived. The mother of Arthur was the cousin of my mother. And her mother was the sister of my grandfather. And they were the preferred sister and brother. When my grandfather opened his clinic, my, my his, uh, sister would sit in the waiting room as if she was waiting for somebody to make somebody sitting there. The grandmother of Arthur. And, um, and I mean, they took my parents in into the house instead of sending them to a camp. It was a very big crescent. Was tremendous. Yes, and then the uh, aunt of Dr. Cohn passed away. They gave the key to my parents and said, You have your own house. Wow. Who would do that? And um, Miriam, your, your father also was very close with uh, Rav Eli Monk from the very Khoshva Monk family. And his daughter, um, they uh, she married uh, Lord Jacobovitz, Rabbi Jacobovitz, who was the chief rabbi of England, and you had a very close connection with her. Yes, Baruch Hashem. She was a very special lady. They, she would phone a lot of people every Shabbos. But you know, the most important thing is not what, what the descendants of whom you are, it's the, person, it's the person you are. Yeah, that's so true. You know, there is a wonderful story that a person comes into a restaurant in America and sees a picture of the uh, Chofetz Chaim on the wall and another picture and he asks the Bala Makom, is it kosher? He says, you ask me if it's kosher, you don't see the pictures? He said, if, Raf, if the Chofetz Chaim was standing here and you were in the picture, I wouldn't ask. That's such a lovely story. 
But the Yichus is, who are you? What are you doing? A father did chesed all his life. And your mother as well. I think you 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 write that your mother till till she could she would visit the poor and she'd visit the, the sick. To ask his his fiance that to do that all her life, I've never heard anybody else in my life asking such a thing. His fiance. He didn't ask anything. My mother. And my mother. He would like. He would have loved my mother to cover her. Hair. My mother said she suffers from headaches. She doesn't want to cover her. Hair. He said it's a pity, but he didn't. Uh, he didn't make a. There was an issue. No, but my mother said I know that many people didn't eat in our house because of not me not covering my hair. But my father gave in because father was very uh, very large. He said yeah, live he and saw, let he live. He saw the big picture. He saw. Yes. Yeah, it's amazing. Yes. He knew that the chinuch was wonderful and. Uh, that was one thing that mother was not, was not ready to do, but he saw that the, that it was fitting, that it was exactly, and I mean they were wonderful parents, and that wonderful zugiyut. Uh, it was a couple, a very couple. they were. For instance, my mother loved to read Romanim. My father would never do that. My father would either learn or read things about um, um, his, his work. The, the papers that would bring the stock market and all kinds of things it was it was important for his for his uh, development but my mother would tell him the books that he she read and years afterwards he would tell her wow. the books that she read she forgot already and he remembered and he remembered the book she he told him because she told him so beautifully and i mean so that's wonderful and um very, something very beautiful that you also write is that on Shabbos, when you had so many guests coming to your home. I still have every Friday evening. But even during when you were in Belgium, when you were wherever you were, your your family had tremendous Hakmasat or him, they always invited guests. I have every Friday evening. But your father would never allow people to discuss uh, politics or what was going on. It was only Limaday Kodesh on Shabbos. He wanted only to discuss the Limaday Kodesh on Shabbos. It's amazing chinuch that he, he gave your family. And we learned first the alphabet before the alphabet. First the Jewish letters. Sure. It's very seldom because it was not a Talmud Chochem. Yeah. It was not a Chosit or, you know, a Jew with... Uh, but it was, it was chinuch um, Hirsch. Simpson Rafael Hirsch. He followed the derech, Torah Avada. It's very, um, it was very practical. Hatsnei alechet. Yeah. Maot maot hatsnei alechet. I will never give more than four salads at the evening or Friday evening. Hatsnei alechet. Don't put your food, your, your table full of. I could put ten salads. No, I won't do it, because it's against it's against the education I got at home. And my 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 husband had the same. Had also a hirsch. When I went to my husband's Friday evenings, uh, his father also would bring Dvar Torah meals. And then you knew the Breuer, the Breuer family as well. Your family were very close to it. Yeah. Sure. So, I, was I just want to thank you so much. I'm just going to, for one second, um, one second. Um, I just want to, from the bottom of my heart, it's uh, been the greatest got the greatest honor and privilege to to hear you and to to meet you and I cannot thank you enough okay. and you should just have at maybe stream in good health muzzle and broker and thank you so very very much thank you very very much <laughs>